Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service of worship. It's warm today. We've got the, the door open to the side. We might need to open a few more doors, let a bit more air in. Uh, if you are a bit uncomfortable, um, you can take a, a layer off if you... Uh, <laughs> you're probably pretty, uh, really there already. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. That'll apply to me more than anybody else. <laughs> um, if you are melting, uh, do uh, uh, feel free to step outside if you need to catch a breath. It's, uh, it's just so humid today. But let's uh, let's open our service in in prayer. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, we rejoice that we can be here and worship you in the name of Jesus. Uh, we thank you, Father, for uh, all uh, your goodness to us, for this uh, marvelous weather that you, you have given us. And Father, we are just uh, enjoying that. Uh, we ask, uh, Lord, as we come here before you, uh, that you would fill our, our hearts with your spirit, uh, that you would enable us to, uh, to worship you as you deserve. And Father, as we meet uh, in your name, uh, may your spirit move among us and upon us, Father, uh, drawing people uh, to yourself. Father, draw us all closer uh, to you, especially uh, those who do not yet know you. Father, uh, we cry out to you uh, for uh, your salvation to come. Father, I just thank you for our time together. Uh, we give you uh, this time. Uh, help us to focus entirely upon you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, now Robin and uh, the team are going to lead us in, in praise. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I just, I guess, have to give a shout out to all the dadas out there. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Who's a daddy? And uh, of course, I have to acknowledge it to our very God in heaven, uh, our Father in heaven. So we're going to start uh, singing how deep the Father's love for us, guys. Okay. So if you're all happy enough, if you're able to, just uh, up stand with or stand up with us, and we'll sing away. Okay. Boost in anything 
suffering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, yeah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. be your name, yeah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, I'm tired now. <laughs> All right, let's just come together in prayer, guys. Um, Lord, we just... I just love to be energized for you, Lord. Um, we just want to lift your name on high. And we just thank you, Lord, that we can be here this morning with you to worship and lift your name on high, Lord. And we thank you so much that you're our Father. You're our Father in heaven, Lord. And, you know, I just, I just pray for people who perhaps their father has not been a good father, Lord. find it hard perhaps even in fathership Lord I just ask that you stand beside them just to let them know that they're enough and even the mums let the mums know that they're enough too that in your eyes Lord we are enough we don't have to be anything else you love us just the way we are exactly how we are there's nothing we can do and we just thank you for your unending love thank you Lord Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of rest and strength let every breath all that I am never cease to worship you shout to the Lord all the earth let us sing power and majesty praise to the King mountains bow down and the sea sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Jesus, I 
our God. Down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we rejoice that you are the everlasting uh, God. Uh, no God uh, was before you. And no other God is coming after you. Uh, you are the one who is and who was and who is uh, to come. You are the sole Lord of heaven and earth, and there is none besides you. And so, Father, to you we come and we bow down and acknowledge that you are God. Uh, Father, forgive us uh, for our failure to acknowledge you in all things. Forgive us our, our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we cry out that you would create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit uh, within us. Father, transform our hearts and our minds, we pray, as we gaze into your word and as you move upon us by your spirit. May we humble ourselves, Father, under your mighty hand that in due time uh, you uh, may lift us up. Father, we worship you for saving us uh, through Jesus for the wonder of your love revealed to us in your Son, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out upon us. May your Spirit rest upon us, Lord God. Lord, yes, pour out your Spirit. Heal our land, we pray. Revive our hearts. May your name be exalted in all the earth. Father, may your name uh, be glorified among us today, every day. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, we're straight on to the announcements today. Uh, the young people, as uh, you may have worked out, have their own uh, program uh, throughout the service uh, today. They've uh, uh, broken up into uh, different areas to, to pray, and it's great that um, kids own our uh, and Sunday School are really taking seriously uh, the need to teach our, our children uh, to pray. Uh, just to highlight a few announcements, I think Kathy, Kathy, come on ahead, do you have an announcement for us? Good morning, everyone. Um, this is an announcement for the ladies of the church. Um, over the last year, we've had different occasions where we've met together, and we've had a really great time of fellowship. We've been planning ahead for 23-24, so a couple of dates, it's on your announcement sheet, but a couple of dates we really would like to highlight is Saturday the 16th of September. After all the holidays are over with, we'd love to get together, go for a bit of a walk. If you don't want to walk, that's fine. We're going to have tea and coffee, we're going to do desserts. And um, there's Laura from Hope and Light is hoping to come and share just um, where they're at at the minute um, in, in that project. So um, you're very welcome to come along. Another date for the, the diary is Saturday the 14th of October. It's the Irish Women's Convention. We've attended those over the last year and it's just been such a blessing to anybody that has been. I could really encourage you all to come. Um, this October, we've decided that we're going to extend it a little bit, and we're going to go out for tea after. So if you want to come for tea, you're very welcome. If you don't, you can go on. There's no problem at all. But please do consider those dates for the diary. We don't have a date or a time yet just for, for uh, the Saturday the 16th, but just listen out um, carefully, and, and uh, we'll get that to you soon. Um, if you're new to Ballydown, you've never been to one of these wee events that we try and do every sort of quarter, um, you'd be more than welcome. There's a sheet at the back. 
uh, it's a WhatsApp group. You're not inundated with WhatsApps, um, but if you put your name down and you're interested, you'll just get a wee bit of information and you can sign up to, to some of the things that we're organising. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Cathy. Uh, the Youth Fellowship Barbecue is on Saturday uh, over at the, the Walkers. Um, there should be a social media link maybe coming up on the screen. There you go. If you uh, we scan that with your phone, you'll uh, get all the, all the details uh, of it. And then we need help with Kids Zone and, and uh, Senior Sunday School stops over the, the summer. As it says there, we will run Sunday Club starting on the 2nd of July for P1 to P7. And if you're able to volunteer to help out with that, please uh, sign up on the sheet at the back. Uh, the resources are all uh, there uh, provided uh, for you. And we thank uh, Jennifer for putting all of that uh, together. Uh, session meets on Monday, uh, tomorrow evening that is at 7.30. Uh, there's child protection training on Wednesday uh, this week in third uh, Ruth Fryland at 7.30. If you're able to attend, please uh, go along uh, to that if you haven't had your training in the past three years and let Elizabeth Smith know uh, that you, you are attending. Uh, Girls Brigade, uh, Sharon Moffat has set up a, a stand in the foyer. Uh, if you have girls who would be interested in uh, signing up for uh, Girls Brigade, uh, then talk to Sharon. Um, you can uh, put uh, their names down, and uh, uh, that's your expression of interest, uh, your uh, early registration, if you like. Um, that's open to all girls, whether you have a background, whether they have a background in, uh, in GB or, or not. And then uh, the General Assembly meets this week uh, from Wednesday through to Saturday. The opening night is on the 21st at 7 p.m., uh, that's an, an open event. Uh, you can attend if you so desire. Our new moderator, uh, Sam Mahoney, will be installed. Uh, there is uh, an open worship session on the Wednesday and an, an evening celebration uh, led by the Reverend John T. Rhodes, who's a church planter in Leeds. Um, our Emma attended uh, John T.'s church for a while, uh, International Presbyterian Church. He's well worth uh, hearing if you're able to go along to that. And you can uh, listen in on, on some of the sessions that are being uh, live-streamed. I think those are all of the announcements. We'll now take the, the offering. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for all your goodness to us, for all your generosity and for every gift. Uh, we return these offerings to you. Father, use all to your glory. We do pray here and around all of this world in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's turn to God's Word. Let's read from Acts chapter 11, uh, page 1105 in the, in the, the Bible that's in the seats. Okay, Acts 11, verse 1. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. 
He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Amen. Let's come to the Lord again in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, the Lord of the whole earth, and uh, you uh, command us to pray for all those in authority over us, kings and rulers of all kinds. So, Father, we do pray uh, for our government. We ask, Lord, that we might have a, a government restored at Stormont. We pray, Lord, that the business of government would start again in our province and start uh, moving forward and taking the important decisions that need uh, made. We ask for the government in Westminster to rule wisely and to make uh, just laws. Father, we look to you in all things. We uh, want to remember our holiday Bible club coming up in the summer. We ask, Father, that there would be enough uh, volunteers for that and for a Sunday club also, uh, that our children might continue to be taught the Word of God and know more about Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the ongoing outreach in the Ground Coffee Shop and for those who have been coming faithfully along. And as we come up, come up to our last uh, session on Thursday, Father, we pray again that your Word will be heard and understood. And we pray, Father, for those uh, who are coming, Lord, to place their faith and trust in Jesus and find salvation in his name. Father, we pray that we will be able to find a premises in the town uh, for our new outreach, uh, our new church plant. We pray, Father, uh, that you would give us uh, grace with that and favor with those who uh, are in control of all of that. We do ask, Father, that uh, planning permission would be granted, Lord, and things could uh, move uh, forward. We pray for our General Assembly, Lord, and all the business that needs uh, discussed over uh, the four days. And Lord, um, just give us grace, enable us, Lord, to uh, consider all that's being put forward and to uh, keep the Lord Jesus Christ at the center of all our, our discussion. Father, we do pray for John Kirkpatrick. We thank you, Lord, for his uh, year that he has uh, served as moderator. Uh, Lord, that he would know your blessing as he stands down. And for Sam Winnie, as he is installed uh, for the coming year, Lord, give him uh, grace and strength and wisdom as he goes around uh, the churches and as he visits overseas, uh, bringing encouragement to our friends and partners 
uh, in different parts of the world. We pray, Father, for the work of the General Council and the seven, di seven different uh, parts of its report that it will present. Lord, we ask for uh, uh, Noel McNeely as he uh, uh, presents those, and we pray for our clerk, Trevor Gribben, also, Lord, give them uh, wisdom as they lead us through all of that business. Father, we pray for our own congregation. Uh, we ask, Lord, for those who are sick and struggling, uh, Father, for, with, whatever, uh, for, with whatever cause, Father, we ask for your healing. We ask for your hand upon them, Lord. Uh, for those who are deeply anxious and worried, Father, may they cast all their anxiety upon you, Father, and know your peace in their hearts. And for all those for, with whom we have contact, Lord, uh, with, for those in our community, Lord, that we uh, may bear witness to, Father, uh, give us courage to share your word, and may we see people coming to know you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, Saturday is uh, Busk Fest, and there'll be people up and down the main street, and um, guys playing guitars, and maybe ladies as well, and uh, they're handing out uh, prizes for uh, who can do the best. It's, it's a good opportunity, actually, for us to do some outreach, and if you'd be interested, um, roughly the three hours between uh, one and four on Saturday, um, I'm happy to go down to Solitude Park, uh, take the sketchboard, set it up, and see if I can uh, talk to people from the sketchboard. If you're interested uh, in doing some outreach or something there in Solitude Park and maybe up and down the street, um, talk to me afterwards. Um, I, I realize I'm, I'm doing this kind of <laughs> informally and off the top of my head, but it'd be a great opportunity. If, if you're interested, uh, we maybe need just about half a dozen or, or, or so people. Uh, we can go uh, with uh, tracks and information we can stop and talk to people for those three, three hours in, in the town on Saturday, um, assuming the weather holds, of course, and all that. But if, if that interests you, um, talk to me afterwards, and we'll see what we can organize uh, between us between now uh, and Saturday, okay? Now, let's uh, turn to that passage that we read in Acts 11. All right, in Acts 11, uh, we come across this church at Antioch. The church at Antioch has justifiably been called the church that changed the world. The reason being that it was a missional uh, church. The, constant, the question that we have constantly to ask ourselves is this, have we a mission mindset or simply a maintenance mindset? And the truth of the matter is that too often we are in maintenance mode rather than a mission mode. Antioch was a missional church, and we really do need to do our best to emulate, uh, imitate this amazing uh, church. First of all, by way of background, Acts 11 is a, a watershed in Acts. It starts with uh, Peter in Jerusalem among his fellow Jewish uh, believers. And it ends with Barnabas and Saul ministering in Antioch to Gentiles. So we have this transition from Jerusalem to Antioch and from the ministry of Peter to that of Paul and from the Jews to the Gentiles. The turning point is there in verse 18. So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. And everything uh, from verse 19 onwards throughout the rest of Acts shows us this very thing happening. From this point, we find that Antioch becomes the center of gospel expansion, Paul becomes the man in focus, and the church becomes more and more a Gentile church. The best guess for dating these events is around AD 45, so we're talking 15 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, and about 10 years on from Saul's Damascus Road conversion. Uh, what Saul was doing for those 10 years, no one knows. We just know that Barnabas fetched him from Tarsus. At this point in time, Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman world after Rome and Alexandria. Athens, by contrast, was a tiny backwater of a place compared to Antioch. Athens, maybe 10 or 20,000 people. But Antioch, population 
possibly heading for half a million, made up of Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Egyptians, Syrians, and Jews, perhaps 50,000 uh, Jewish people. Antioch was the capital of the province of Syria. It was the military headquarters of Rome in the east. It was a trade center, a cultural and religious melting pot. According to the Jew Jewish historian Josephus, Herod the Great, he's the guy who uh, built the temple who tried to kill the infant Jesus, uh, Herod the Great to impress Rome uh, paved the main street with two and a half miles of polished marble and a covered walkway supported by 3,200 columns. It was a cesspool of vice. Juvenal, a Roman writer, complained that the sewage of Antioch flowed all the way to Rome. So here's Antioch, the largest city in the Roman East, a trade center, a melting pot of humanity, a cesspool of filth and every kind of depravity, and where does the Lord, by the power of the Spirit, plant the Gentile mission? Answer, Antioch. There was a missionary whose name I cannot recall. He said, always plant your mission within a yard of hell. Why? Well, because that's where the lost are. It's a bit like the bank robber who was asked why he robbed banks, and he says, well, because that's where the money is. The Lord planted his mission to the Gentiles in pagan Antioch because that's where the lost were. And it was the church in Antioch, not the church in Jerusalem, that changed the world. Why? Because it was a missional church. Why do we want to plant our outreach in the middle of the town? Because that's where the people are. You need a car to get here to Ballydown, but people walk up and down Newry Street all day long. And that's where we want to be, if at all possible. I wish I could tell you that we have a place already sorted, but we don't as yet. Now, what are the characteristics of this world-changing missional uh, church? First answer to that question has to be courageous evangelism. Verse 19, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyr Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. You can see the point there, can't you? And remember that this is 15 years on from the resurrection and the command of Jesus to take the gospel to all nations. Up to this point, only Jews really were hearing the gospel, apart from a few notable exceptions like the Ethiopian eunuch and Cornelius. But now men from Cyprus and Cyrene break the barrier completely and they go directly to the Gentiles. Result, massive breakthrough. Great numbers of people believe. These men are what Tim Keller called mavericks, and they were, uh, but they were also ordinary men. For example, we can think of extraordinary individuals, men like uh, John Wesley and George Whitfield, who were mavericks in their day. At times, they even found, them shut out, found themselves shut out of the pulpits. So they broke that barrier, took to the open air, and preached and saw multitudes converted. W.P. Nicholson in this country was another maverick. His blunt and direct style of preaching offended many people, but that man's ministry sparked the last revival seen in this province in the 1920s, and thousands of people were converted. Now, those mavericks were well known. They were famous individuals in their day, but the mavericks in Antioch were ordinary men whose names have not, e not even been recorded for us. And what we need today more than ever are these anonymous mavericks. People who are happy to be unknown, happy to be anonymous, happy to fly below the radar, but who are not happy unless they are sharing the gospel and finding ways and means of getting the message out. And we have an opportunity on Saturday, God willing, if we can take it. <clears throat> we need uh, courageous evangelists. We need men and women, ordinary, ordinary men and women, marked by a concern for the lost and for the glory of God that drives them to share the gospel. And those are the critical marks of someone who is an evangelist, a deep concern for the lost and a concern that God's name be honored. Uh, some time ago, we took as a series gospel-shaped outreach, and we had uh, John Lawson along uh, to help us think about that. But as yet, I don't think we have reached the point where we have made personal evangelism normal. 
uh, Mes McConnell, who's planting churches all over uh, Scotland, talks about the need to create a culture of evangelism in our churches. And he's right, and we need to work on this. Courageous evangelism is the mark of a missional church and needs to be restored among us. The next mark of a, a missional church is conversion, conversion growth. Verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Also, verse 24, a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Uh, PCI as a, den a denomination is in rapid decline. The same is true for all of the main denominations in our province. There's a very extensive report highlighting this decline, which will be presented uh, later this week at the General Assembly. I am very glad that this is now being addressed, but it should have been on the floor of the Assembly 20 or 30 years ago. According to the census figures, the main denominations are down between a quarter and a third, and some of the smaller denominations are down by as much as 75%. At the same time, there's been a significant rise in the numbers of those registering no religious affiliation, the nuns as they are called, as in N-O-N-E-S, okay, the nuns, and they have increased from 141,000 uh, to 361,000 in the last uh, 50 years. That's up 250%. Who are these people? Well, the vast majority of them are former uh, Protestants, Presbyterian, Church of Ireland, Methodist, and so on. That's who they are. Now, what the census figures don't tell us is how many people are actually in the pews on a Sunday. That's a much uh, worse figure, especially since COVID. The census says that PCI is down 25% since 1970, whereas our own figures say that we're actually down 50%. What has happened? Well, we have ceased to be a missional church. PCI has not been marked by conversion growth in at least the last 50 years. What has gone wrong? Did we as a denomination get bogged down in the middle of the troubles, batten down the hatches and not reach out? Yes, uh, we did in reach. We saw people converted from within, but those numbers of people being converted did not keep pace with those who stopped attending. Was it the case that encountering the living God became a matter of the mind and not the heart? Yes. The Bible became more of a textbook and a source of doctrine than the means of knowing the living God. And the church became more of a social institution than an outpost of the coming kingdom. It was the same, of course, in the time of Jesus. Religion always tends to take over. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you dil diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the Scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life, John 5, 39, 40. These things are a major challenge for us. The report itself on the reconfiguration of ministry, as it's called, is available online. It's on PCI's website. I don't have space here to summarize it, but you can download it. The report acknowledges that PCI may get a whole lot smaller before it ever gets any bigger. So there's plenty of realism there. It says that PCI is faced with five tasks all at once. One, closing churches. Two, managing the decline of some churches towards closure. Three, supporting other declining churches back into growth, four, supporting growing churches, and five, planting churches. It may come as no surprise to you to know that for my money, the last of those is by far the most important and the most likely to produce conversion growth. As the bank robber said, that's where the money is. That report will be presented at the assembly, and if it is adopted, then the presbyteries are going to have a busy year wrestling with all its proposals and then sending all that back to the assembly next year for concrete decisions. I would urge you to pray that the report is adopted. Doing nothing is not an option. We need to get back to being a missional church, and we will know that we are a missional church when we start seeing conversion growth. Another mark of a missional church is teaching. Verse 25, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch, so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. 
Remember what the Great Commission says. Jesus said, go and make disciples. How? Well, two things, baptizing them and teaching them. Those are the two parts of it. Uh, those are the two aspects of making disciples, evangelism and teaching. Evangelism, as we can see from this account, has been happening rapidly in Antioch. Great numbers of people are turn, turning to the Lord. And now they need to teach these people if they are to be properly disciples. They cannot leave the job half done. Barnabas realizes this. In fact, there's so many people coming to the Lord, he needs help. And he goes off to Tarsus to find Saul. We won't make disciples without teaching them either. As the Lord said in the Great Commission, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's not teaching with the aim of producing head knowledge, but teaching towards obedience, teaching towards living a life that follows in the Master's footsteps. Paul in Romans 1, 5, as part of his introduction to Romans, says this, through him, that is through Jesus, and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to, to what? Calling them to what? The obedience that comes from faith. You see how Paul describes what he is doing? Calling people to the obedience that comes from faith. He's calling people out of where they are to a whole new way of life. The obedience that comes from faith. Faith comes first. And out of that comes their obedience to Jesus, their new way of life. Maybe you haven't heard the Christian life described in that way, but that's how Paul describes it there in Romans 1, 5. 1 verse 5, it's the obedience that comes from faith. People coming to faith is the result of evangelism. Obedience is the fruit of faith as we walk in the way of the Lord, and that requires teaching that we may know what that way is. So here we are, we've been given the great commission by the Lord Jesus Christ, or the great command if you like. This command was given by the Lord to His church, obviously. We, the church, have to engage in courageous evangelism. That's the first part of the commission. Evangelism produces believers, converts. These converts need teaching and incorporated back into the church, and that closes the loop. The church, now having new members added to it, then evangelizes and disciples others. And we go around the loop again and again and again. This loop can break down in various ways. At times, we evangelize and do not follow up with adequate teaching. Or we are busy teaching those who never came to faith in the first place, and then we wonder why they fall away so easily. But one of the clear marks of a missional church is teaching. Otherwise, we are not going to be a missional church for very long. It's the only way to keep that loop going round and round. Another mark of a missional church is mercy ministry. Verses 27 to 30. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, one of them named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Some people have the idea that mercy ministry is not really a core part of the work. But clearly, mercy ministry here is being kicked off by the Holy Spirit as he speaks through Agabus. Mercy ministry is also the outworking of the second great command, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the second command is built on the first command, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or as, or as John says, for anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. At the same time, it's very important to note the order here. Evangelize, convert, teach, repeat, and out of that comes mercy ministry. If that is not the order, then we're heading for disaster. For a start, mercy ministry without all of the rest of this in place will convert no one. The gospel at the end of the day is a message, and that message has to be put over in words. And secondly, mercy ministry without the rest is simply unsustainable. Very soon, the whole ministry would have to die for lack of funds and lack of people. And isn't that what happens? There are churches up and down the province engaged in active and good mercy ministries at home and overseas, but it is not sustainable unless the rest of this is in place. 
It's not sustainable in terms of finance. Even more critically, it's not sustainable in terms of people who aren't there to do the work if we are not, in the first place, missional churches. If we are not fully engaged in the Great Commission, in courageous evangelism, seeing conversion growth, teaching new believers, and closing the loop back to the church and repeating that, then we have no mercy ministry on an ongoing basis. Most of the overseas work of PCI is mercy ministry, and it is in decline. We cannot sustain it. People are not coming forward. And is it any wonder that we cannot also sustain our ministry in PCI? We don't have enough people coming forward. Why? Well, again, because we have ceased to be a missional church. Yes, mercy ministries are one of the marks of a missional church because only a missional church can sustain mercy ministries in the long term. Finally, and for my money, the supreme, work, the supreme mark of a missional church is that the Holy Spirit is at work. And you'll see this right throughout the whole chapter. It was the Holy Spirit who directed Peter to go to Cornelius in the first place. It was the Holy Spirit who fell upon the audience as Peter began to speak, verse 15. In fact, he came upon the Gentiles in exactly the same way as he came upon the believers on the day of Pentecost. That, that is emphasized. This fulfilled what the Lord said as Peter went on to say, verse 16, Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Later on, as the Gentiles start turning to the Lord in greater numbers, Barnabas is dispatched to encourage the work, and he's a man like Stephen, full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Agabus, speaking by the Holy Spirit, prophesies about this famine that is coming, and immediately the church responds to the direction of the Holy Spirit. They get aid together and send it off. They don't even wait for the famine to arrive. They listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church, and they get on with it. Surely it is obvious from this passage and throughout Acts that it is the work of the Holy Spirit that produces a living church. And where this is not the case, you just have mere religion. Uh, somehow uh, the idea became that built on uh, sound doctrine and good church structures, we might know the living God, and therefore produce spiritual life and vitality. But that, in fact, is upside down. It is spiritual vitality that produces sound doctrine and a healthy church, isn't it? We must have the new birth and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, or the rest is just empty, it's just structure. You could build the most amazing car in the world, but without fuel, it's just a museum piece. And is this not largely where we are in our denominations, more like museums to a vibrant past? Where do we begin to fix this? Tim Keller, who passed away just last month, sought to recover this. He talked about the need for gospel renewal. By that term, he meant two things. The need for corporate renewal or revival at the level of the denomination and the need for personal renewal and revival in each one of us. He maintained strongly and rightly that gospel renewal has to function at both levels if we are to have healthy, growing churches. True spiritual life begins with the transformation of the individual by the new birth. And the new birth is what God does within us as we take hold of Christ by faith. I think one of the reasons Jesus described conversion as a new birth is to emphasize the fact that birth is not something that we have anything to do with. We do not give birth to ourselves. Nothing gives birth to itself. It doesn't work physically and it doesn't work spiritually. It's amazing how often the natural world illustrates the spiritual, but then, of course, it's the same God who made all things, both natural and spiritual. The Christian life begins with the work of the Holy Spirit in the new birth and continues with the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Likewise, the Christian church began with the work of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, giving birth to this new thing on the face of the earth and continues through the acts of the Holy Spirit in power through the church. In PCI, we're at last beginning to ask ourselves some very hard questions about the reconfiguration of ministry, albeit very late in the day. But if we do not return to being a missional church like the church in Antioch, then we are no further forward. 
And I say that because my concern is right there in the title of the report, Reconfiguration of Ministry. Because if all we are doing is rearranging the pieces on the board, then we are not addressing the heart of the problem. And the heart of the problem is spiritual, not structural. The only way in which we will recover our character as a missional church is revival and renewal of ourselves and the church itself. How does such a thing begin? The answer is prayer. Revivals and renewal all begin with prayer. They begin when we get desperate enough to get on our knees and cry out to the living God for, for mercy, mercy upon us and upon our land. 2 Chronicles 7.14 is often quoted, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's the promise of God to us. To access the promise, we need to do what it says and humble ourselves and pray. And along with prayer needs to be a recovery of the heart of the gospel. We have to start with this, that we are sinners in the hands of an angry God and we deserve all that's coming to us. When that is understood, then we can turn to Jesus and find the salvation that He offers. We can find salvation in the one who says to us, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, John 1, 51. Jesus came to open heaven. He came as the stairway between heaven and earth. And when we come to Him, we enter into life in His name. We need to recover ourselves as a missional church. We need to be like this church in Antioch, marked by courageous evangelism, conversion growth, sound teaching, which then results in mercy ministries. And above all, there needs to be clear evidence of the Holy Spirit at work. It was tremendously encouraging to see a few weeks ago the, the powerful effects of a move of the Holy Spirit over in Asbury in the United States how we need such moves of the Holy Spirit here. As you look outside, you will readily realize that we've had four weeks or so of zero rainfall and the grass and the, is turning brown and the crops are not growing. Now that the rain has come on the dry land, everything will be jumping out of the ground once again. And again, doesn't the physical, illustrate for us the spiritual. We need the Holy Spirit to fall like rain on our dry, parched souls and bring life to the spiritually dead who are all around us. God, have mercy on us that we may be restored as a missional church. Let's pray. Uh, Father, you have given us your word for a reason, that we might look into it, even as a mirror, and Father, see us as we really are. And Father, we do not live up to this church in Antioch, so we cry out to you, Father, for your spirit to fall upon us like rain from, from heaven. Father, God, change us. Make us into a people and a church, Lord, that will really reach out, Lord, that we will seek and save the lost, Father, and train up those, Lord, who come, that they may in turn go out. Father, forgive us. Father, come, we do pray by your Spirit, and move among us, and change us, Lord. Make us once again a missional church. In the name of Jesus, we cry. Amen. Uh, team, are going to come back and uh, lead us in our closing uh, worship. Uh, if you're a visitor, see if you uh, visitors around, um, you're very welcome to stay for tea and coffee, both in the foyer and in the hall. Uh, please do chat to us. There's the GB stand in the foyer as well. Talk to, to Sharon. There's prayer ministry to your left. Uh, please, if there's anything on your heart that you need a prayer for, you need covered in prayer, uh, please uh, make your uh, way over, that, over there. Thank you.
Okay, guys, you all like to join us uh, as we stand and we sing our last, uh, our last praise song, Amazing Grace, Our Chains Are Gone. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that saw. together the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Oh, oh, sorry, <laughs>